Well, welcome, middle schoolers. How are you guys doing? Those of you who came to Trout Creek, how was your school, school day yesterday? Tired? Were you tired? Bummed you had to go back to school? Yeah, I know, man. Well, hey, good thing that next week is Thanksgiving break. Isn't that awesome? How many of you guys are going out of state, out of state, out of Oregon for Thanksgiving? Who's traveling the furthest? Where are you going? Germany? Whoa! 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 Tough to beat. Are you celebrating Thanksgiving there? Dang. That's so cool. What, what, what do you eat at Germany Thanksgiving? You'll be in Paris for Thanksgiving. Oh, okay, all right. Whatever. Have you been? Have you been to Paris? No. Have you been to Germany? So this, you're just doing it for fun? Your cousins. Oh, that's cool. That's so sweet. Okay, who's going further than Germany or Paris? Oh. Jake? I'm going to my grandma's house. Where, where's your grandma live? Washington. Washington. Okay. <laughs> I believe you can get there by car, but Germany is by plane or boat. So I don't know if that is. Four it takes four hours? How long is your plane flight? How long is your plane flight? A day and a half. That's a little bit longer than four you. hours. <laughs> Oh, hey, that, that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, wait, wait, where are you going? Everybody's pointing at you. Russia. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. What? Does that, that beat Germany? <laughs> why, does that beat Germany? Can I get the numbers on this thing? Oh, my gosh. Why are you going to Russia? Your mom's mom. Wow. So your grandma. That's your awesome. grandma lives there. What, have you been? Are you scared? Are you excited? Are you going to bring a parka? Oh, you might get a little bit too cold if you don't bring a parka. Um, well, hey, guys, we are thankful that you guys are here. Announcement, since next week is Thanksgiving, that means that we do not have middle school next Tuesday, okay? So we're taking a week off. What, Faith, what is your question? Germany wins. Oh, Germany wins. Oh, okay. Well, well, where at in Germany? Does that matter? Where at in Germany? Where at in Russia? Oh. Okay. Russia's well, huge. anyways, be... that's cool. That's cool. So don't forget, if you show up next week, we won't be here because we're busy being thankful for the things that we already have and what God has given to us. Uh, we also, every single Sunday, we meet in the Summit Room, which is a room upstairs at 1045. We have a middle school service. Uh, if you guys come to church here on Sundays, we'd love to see you at 1045. If you don't currently go somewhere, we would love if you came and joined us. Some of your leaders are going to be there. We're going through a video series right now. It's a fun time. Again, that's 1045 a.m. Every single Sunday, we will be gathering together. It's going to be a really, really good time. Uh, and then, well, we don't have TCBC, so that's not an announcement. So that's everything that I have. That's everything that I have for this segment. So why doesn't everybody stand up as we begin worship? I'm going to pray for us, and we'll move right in to singing some songs. Sound good? All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for these students. Thank you for bringing them here, fulfilling this place. God, I pray uh, that you would just bless this time, Lord, as we get to learn about what your word has to say about manhood. I pray that you give us ears to hear and a heart to listen from you. Uh, please be with Jenny and Jarell as they're bringing the word. God, just help them to communicate clearly to these students uh, your design for manhood and how it should look in this world. So, Lord, I pray that these students' hearts would be prepared to hear from you directly. Lord, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But He came and He died and He rose and those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we called death and grave they were like mountains that stood in our way But He came and He died and He rose and those 
giants are dead now. Sing, this is our God. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. For the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God. King Jesus. It took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But He heard every word, every whisper and Now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of His faithfulness Never once did He fail Jesus, who pulled me out of that pit, He did, He did, who paid for all of our sin, nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise, nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Him. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. from the 
the start Your son for redemption The price for my heart I don't have the context For that kind of love I don't understand I can't comprehend Lord, I just thank you that we can run to you at any point, that you'll always take us back, and that we can call you a father, even if our earthly father hasn't always been there for us. You are, and your grace is enough. Your grace is sufficient for us. So we thank you that you are a good father, and that we can run into your open arms. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Check, 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 check. All right. Can we thank our worship team? Y'all, some of y'all are still tired from TCBC, huh? You guys recover from that? You guys all right? No. I'm glad there's so many of you here. That <laughs> right. There's not more sick. A lot of our leaders are sick. Yeah, like half of our leaders. You guys wore them out. Whew. Yeah. Man, well, good to be with you guys. So glad that you're here. Um, we started this new series last week called What Does It Mean to You? And there's kind of two sides to that, really. I think our culture and is, is just saying, hey, you can answer that on your own. What, is, what do these things mean to you? What does it mean to be a woman or a man or a child? Like, what does it mean to you? You could just come up with whatever answer you want and that'll be the right answer for you. Your truth is your truth. But the other side to that is that we should be asking this question to God because he created us. We should be asking this question to him. Lord, what does this mean to you? You created us. 
And so instead of answering it for ourselves and not looking to him, not looking to his word, which gives us instruction in these things, we need to ask him and not trust just our own answer on this. And so tonight, last week, we, we talked about womanhood. Tonight, we're talking about manhood. And we talked about how God has a design and purpose for the gender that we've been born into. Um, last week, we talked about how we're both made in the image of God. We're both made after his likeness. So we're all equal in worth and in value. And at the same time, there are differences between men and women, right? Like, I think we can acknowledge that. Like, there are differences. And we see this even in the creation story. But before, before I comment on some of this, let me, let me just pray for us and get us in the right space. Ask for the Lord's help in this. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your truth. And we don't want to just trust what we feel or what our own experiences tell us. We don't wanna answer this question on our own. So we're asking you, Lord, what does this mean to you? What is your intention for men? Lord, would you answer that through your word, through us tonight? Would you teach every student here tonight? Would you speak to them? Would we be compelled by your story of redemption found in your son Jesus and live in that, loving you and loving our neighbor? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So in the creation story, we see that men and women are created differently at different times. The man is given responsibility for the garden and for keeping the law, which is why when the law was broken, we see in Genesis 3 that, that God addresses and condemns Adam specifically. Uh, there was instruction that was given to him before Eve was created. Uh, there's a one-sided emphasis upon the man leaving his father and mother and being united to his wife, and she is not said to leave her father and mother in the same way. And so God created men and women, and we should delight in the differences, not use them to compete against one another. Because here's the reality, and we mentioned this last week, man alone does not represent the fullness of God's image, okay? So God created man and women to image him after his likeness. Not one fully gives us that picture or completes it. And so the woman is to bring strength in this, to have this partnership and ruling together in complementing one another. And in this complementing framework, there is strength. There's this responsibility of strength that's given to the man. Later on in the New Testament, Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, saying, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you according to the grace of life. So there's this strength that's been given and in most cases, guys are typically stronger than girls. Right now in middle school, it's it's a little probably all a little equal. Place. It's okay, it's yeah. Fully it's, grown, <laughs> fully grown. Right now, though. So we probably did, yeah. Developmentally. It's right, better, yeah. but we need to understand here. This isn't a value statement. It's not like being stronger physically is better, and God is saying, "Oh yeah, you are more better because you are built this way." No. Even in this verse, it says that they are heirs together. They are of equal worth. It just means that, guys, you have a great responsibility to show honor to your sisters with your strength. And not just your sisters as in biological sisters. When we say sisters, we mean any, any girl around you, your neighbors, right? Anyone around you 
at school, even now, the people that are around you in your sphere of influence, those ladies around you, they are to be considered sisters. That's how the Bible gives us this framework of siblinghood. We should view one another as brothers and sisters. And so you are given this responsibility of strength to show honor. This passage talks specifically to husbands, but God's plan for men isn't restricted to just marriage or fatherhood. Even, even you, in your season of life, can use your strength to honor one another. Unfortunately, as Jenny, Jenny's going to show us, Adam did not choose to live that out. And, you know, it's kind of funny. I can't imagine that way back at the beginning of time that Adam and Eve um, had any idea what their choices were going to do for the rest of mankind, right? Probably no idea. And I, I think that's a lot like us with our sin. We, um, so often we just don't think of it as being like a big deal uh, or like really understanding the fullness of the consequences unless you know, we're going to get caught, then all of a sudden, <laughs> then we think about it. But if we aren't caught, then we don't really think about how significant our sin is. And I think that's kind of what was going on with them. Um, but the fall, you know, that initial sin, that led to all of the pain, all of the suffering, all the brokenness that we see today. So every divorce, every broken family, every kid that feels neglected by their parent, Every horrific abuse, every crime, all of that come back to the beginning of sin. So it was a pretty big deal what went down, right? And they had no idea. Um, but Adam was not doing what he was made to do as a man. And that is why biblical manhood is so important, okay? When you don't take it as important, you don't see it as important, like we, we see all that has happened now because he didn't see how important it was. Um, and when we saw last week, Jarrell kind of touched on this already, there, this kind of resulted in this competition, this we're competing for power, we're competing for all kinds of different things, but we aren't seeing each other as partners that are complementing one another. Um, and really, we see that Adam, in the fall, he really misuses his strength. Um, instead of using his strength to protect and lead, um, he rejects his strength, and he passively watches Eve do the very thing that God commanded him not to do. And I've always thought about that. Um, I wonder why he didn't stop it. Like, why didn't Adam go, like, Eve, don't listen to that snake, you know? Like, why didn't he step in and say, like, you know, don't do that? Like, was it because he was being selfish? Was he, I mean, he knew God said she was, like, if you, you know, if you eat it, you're going to die. So was he kind of like, well, I'd really like to be like God, so maybe I'll see if she eats it. I'll let her die. Yeah, I wonder right? if you really will. I don't know. Like, but I'm going to go ahead and let look, her let's do it. Let's see what happens. Let, and then, yeah. oh, she takes a bite. She's fine. He's like, okay, yeah, I'll go ahead and have some, right? Like, what, what all was going on there, you know? And that he just didn't mind the consequences would happen to her. But that was a responsibility that he had. And, I mean, we don't know all of the reasons for it, but we know that he thought she would die and and he let her do it anyways. And, you know, I think that that shows a lot. It's like there was a responsibility that could have eliminated all of that. Today, you might see this in some boys not using their strength to protect, but using it to harm or being neglectful of their straight strength and letting harm happen to people. There's a competition for power between guys and gals. Um, and then the curse came. And so then with women, there's this wrong desire for relationship. There's wrong desire of men. And that's part of the curse. And then, um, and then instead of seeing headship as a responsibility, then they have like the rule over, over the woman as, a, as part of the curse. And so it already like jacked it all up. And, um, you know, God made us in his image to reflect his glory. And, and really only through Jesus is that even possible. And so um, I'm thankful that the fall happened, but then Jesus comes, right? And there's redemption. So there's redemption in all of this. Um, you know, and uh, God I, didn't leave us in that state of sin no. and brokenness. Yes. I love a Timothy Keller quote. It says that God cares so deeply about our brokenness that he himself enters into it. Like, that's that beauty of redemption, yeah, right? Yeah, he's not going to stand by yeah. and let something happen like Adam did. He's like, no, I'm getting into this thing. Yeah. Um, and Jesus really models what true manhood should look like. And um, one of the examples of this comes from um, what Jesus did in John 13. It's this awesome story during the Last Supper um, where Jesus 
took a towel, he ties it around his waist, he pours water in a bowl and began to wash the disciples' feet. And it says, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should, you also should do just as I have done to you. And so this is Jesus initiating what it looks like to lead. Um, he's loving, he's serving, he's giving. Um, you know, in that culture, in that time, anyone who'd wash their feet, that was kind of like, you know, like the slaves and like the lowly. It was definitely like something they would kind of even do as woman's work. And so when Jesus did it, it's like, what are you even doing? And he's like, no, this is what it looks like to be loving. This is what it looks like to lead. And, um, and, and so then, we have some bowls we're going to get out and we're going to, no, I'm just all kidding. All the boys <laughs> are washing feet tonight. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, everyone's like, oh, gross. How Hor embarrassing. Like, Don't touch horrified. me. Cooties. Yeah. No, we're not doing, we're not I'm doing just kidding. any of that. Okay. It's a joke. Okay. okay. Sorry. I yeah. lost some of that. I know. <laughs> but, but what we do see is Jesus is setting an example that he wants his disciples to do. So he's equipping them for what he's calling them to do and he's empowering them to do it. And that's really what it is to, to lead. It really is to equip and empower, to set an example and then give people the strength to do those things, to be just like him. Yeah, that's right. And so this plays out in some of the principles that we want to give you because this doesn't just mean to go and wash a bunch of people's feet. Like that's that's not the point. The point is that this would be an example of humility and service. Yeah. And so the first principle that I want to give you guys is one of being selfless. Being selfless. Let's be honest. Most of us are selfish. Like we think about ourselves a lot and we're not prone to think about others first. But Jesus gives us this example and exemplifies for us and we live this out in the way that we love. Mm -hmm. We love the Lord our God with all of our strength, with all of our mind, with all of our heart, with all of our soul and we increase in our love for him as we get to know him. We open up his word and we want to know him and grow in our knowledge and relationship with him. It means that from there, that's the foundation that, that we would love our neighbor as ourselves. In marriage, my neighbor, my nearest neighbor is my wife, okay? <laughs> Guys, if you get married one day, Scripture tells us to love our wife as Christ loves the church. Now, those are some big shoes to fill. But that is the kind of love, that's the kind of selflessness that is required of us. And that's the type of selflessness that we can practice and exemplify now. We don't need to be married to do it. We can show this love for God and for one another. And Jesus gives us the example. He does so. We can look to him as our author and finisher of the faith, Hebrews 12 says. He is our example to follow in this. I was reading an article about this and and it gave just this comparison and it said, boys say, I'm responsible for myself. Men say, I'm responsible for my neighbor. Boys are forced to give, like, hey, you better share with your sister, right? <laughs> boys are forced to give, but men freely give because they've been freely given to. Boys expect their wife or their mom to do the dishes, right? Pick up after you. <laughs> Come on, you know it's true. But men, men are quick to grab the sponge and soap. Ultimately, manhood means serving others as much and more than you serve yourself. That's what it means. Some of you guys are like, no, nah, I'm, I'm not grabbing no sponge and soap. And guess what? That just shows where you're at, right? You're still a boy. <laughs> and that's okay. I don't expect you to be a man yet, but I'm showing you 
This is the principle that's shown for us. This is the example that's given to us in God's word. Jenny, or Jesus shows us this kind of selflessness in the story that, that Jenny told. Yeah, and I, you know, one thing that I think is interesting, it's like um, a lot of our culture brings, right, these tasks that are kind of for one or the other gender. And, um, you know, those kinds of things are kind of put on all of us. And, you know, even what family we grow up in is, the, is that kind of stuff happens. But, um, you know, it's, it's a really good thing when you see um, guys being selfless in this way. Um, you know, it hasn't always been the case that even, like, you know, here, like even within my job, that um, the men that I've worked with have been really quick to, like, help out and, like, you know, there's, like, every Wednesday night, there's always all these dishes to do. There's all of these things to do. And um, continually, Jarrell and Josh and Nathan are, they're, they're always just like, hey, what do you need? How can I help? Yeah, let me go wash those. Let me go do those things. Like, it isn't something that they're like, okay, Jenny, like, you're on the dish pit. Like, go for it, right? Like, that's not, that's not what it is. And so you see them sacrificing of themselves to do that, which is, like, just a blessing to me and really displays like what Jesus is like, which I'm really thankful for. We're complimenting for. one another, right? It's yeah. this partnership. Yes. So one's not more important than the other. No. And, and so there's this partnership that takes place. Yeah. So the next thing is sacrificial. Jesus was sacrificial. So to be a godly man means taking responsibility to provide sacrificial leadership. Um, there's a quote that says, God um, gives men strength and power, generally speaking, only so they will use it to bless those who don't have it. Did you hear that? Ooh, that's, that's that'll preach right there, let you me should, tell you. like, really <laughs> take that down. And we see this over and over again. I mean, um, in Deuteronomy 10, it says, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways? And what were his ways? That's that great commandment that comes from, is to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, um, to keep, keep his commandments and statutes. And then in Micah 6, 8, it says, he has told you, oh man, what is good? What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? And then in Matthew 23, there's a reference to this where these religious leaders, Jesus is talking to them, and he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you will tithe your mint and dill and cumin. Like you've been giving all of these things, trying to act like you're something. But the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. And so it's this heart thing. There's all of these things that God is calling them to do, this sacrificing, right? It's not just like surface level things, but it's really sacrificing for the right kind of things. And this is what God's doing. He's calling these guys to justice and to kindness and to mercy and to faithfulness, to things that, you know, um, that when you have the authority, like you can kind of give, like when you have some of that strength that you can give to those things, those are big callings. And manhood ultimately looks like walking in God's ways. It's just being more like God. That's what biblical manhood is. And Jesus, you know, he had all of the power. He had all of it, right? He'd done all of those healings. He'd brought someone back from the dead. He'd done a bazillion things. And then having all of that strength, he lets them take him. He lets them whip him. He lets them hang him on a cross, right? At any point, he could have been like, no, y'all are toast. He had all of that power, but for our sake, he sacrificed and he emptied himself of that power to love us and to give his life for us. Um, the other quote is, it says, um, Christian manhood isn't defined by healthy balance or barbecue, and it's certainly not marked by getting cars, women, and likes. Christian manhood is about men treasuring and imitating the perfect man, Jesus Christ. That's really what manhood is. Some of y'all are like, man, that's a new, that's a new discovery for me. I've never heard that before. I, I mean, that, this would have been new to me hearing this in middle school, for sure. Jesus, this is the thing. And here's, here's the third principle. It's self-control. Jesus himself did not come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom. He freely gave of himself. So true men don't cut corners for their own personal comfort and convenience. And yet there's this story in our culture 
that a real man is just all about himself, just your pursuit of doing you, climbing the ladder, doing whatever you can to get there. And once you get there, you know, you can abuse the people, you can step all over people just to get where you want, just do you. Like that's the narrative that I hear in our culture. And this idea of being a man just, it drives me crazy because it is so far from the truth. Is being a man really about getting the most money or power or women? Is it really about indulging in every desire or giving in to every whim? Giving in to the dirty joke or the pornography or giving in to the lust? Is it really about standing by as someone else hurts another person? I hate that, that that was the type of thinking that I had as a student. Like that was, that was my thought process. And it wasn't difficult to live for myself. <laughs> Guess what, it's not, it's not hard. It's really easy to think about yourself first, to put my needs and interests above everyone else's, to use my strength to hurt instead of protect and serve to serve myself instead of serving others. It turns out it's pretty easy to not be faithful to just one person, but to lie and to cheat and to steal. It's pretty easy to do those things, actually. I think the culture's idea of being a man is weak. I think it's weak. It doesn't take much effort to do those things, to think about yourself first, to objectify that girl, to give in to every desire that you have. That's weak, bro. Mm -hmm. Seriously. The strong idea, the the strong man that Jesus gives us the example of is one that doesn't give in to every little desire that they have, but they have self-control for the deepest desires, the deepest desires of loving God and loving our sisters and brothers, the deepest desire of putting others above ourselves, of serving God and serving one another. Real men deny themselves cheap pleasures for true joy in Jesus. Yeah, and the the last principle we're going to talk about is um, safety, which might seem weird, Um, but um, I feel like this is an area that's typically overlooked when biblical manhood is being talked about. Um, We'll hear this protection that, you know, and maybe some of you guys, like, you know, like, that your dad is like, I'm going to protect, and, you know, you want to protect, and hey, like, hey, guys, make sure you protect your sister. Make sure you do those things. Um, But it's not just from physical harm. Um, that you can, you can do things to provide safety that's emotionally safe or relationally safe, um, making people secure and even spiritually safe, right? With Adam and Eve, we see like he didn't take care of all of those areas of safety for her. He didn't protect her from all of those things. Um, and I think one of the differences that we have that men have in this strength is, you know, I just sent my daughter Lucy, and some of you know her. She um, got to go over to um, uh, Denmark this summer for three weeks. And I was really nervous her traveling all the way over there and scared, definitely scared for her safety. And I got her a taser and mace, okay, for her trip because I was so scared. Yeah, mace, yeah. And uh, she had a checked bag. It was all legal, calm down, okay. Um, but there were, there were young men that were going on the trip too, and I can guarantee none of their moms bought them tasers or mace. Right, why is that? Okay, it's super different, right? Boys, when you grow up and become guys, you don't go into parking lots with keys between your fingers. You aren't checking the back seat to make sure no one is gonna get you. A lot of men don't even think about that. Like I talk to the guys, it's like, no, they, it doesn't even nope. cross their mind. I, I never okay? even thought of that. Uh, always, every time. Every time, dark parking lot. Every time I'm on the side of the street, I see a guy come, I'm going to the other side of the street if it's at night, every time. Okay, that's something to the pack that like, yeah, you are physically stronger than us. That, that's terrifying. And so you have the ability to bring your strength that God gave you and to, and to provide safety for everyone. 
And that is an incredible thing that we really need from you. And not just your strength to protect us from bad guys, but also from other guys like bad thoughts. To protect us from being emotionally abused, to protect us from being um, neglected or discarded or any of those things that make us feel unsafe. That is also something that if you are like Jesus, being like Jesus means that you are taking care of those things and you're bringing your strength to that. And that, that is biblical manhood and it is awesome. And I appreciate it so much. And again, that's something that these guys, like if we're ever late at night and I'm walking somewhere, they never let me go by myself. Never. They're always like, are you okay? Do you need anything? And they walk with me, right? And that, I mean, I'm just thankful for that. I'm so thankful for that. Remember our passage from last week, Philippians 2, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Jesus humbled himself to the point of death. He put our interests above his own. And he gives us this model to follow. Man, I'll tell you right now, this example to follow, this is God's design for us. And some of us have seen the brokenness of when it's not followed. I have. My grandma started raising me when I was in sixth grade because of the brokenness that I experienced with my dad and then with my mom's boyfriend. The abuse, the unfaithfulness there, the using the strength to abuse and being unfaithful to my mom and, and moving out and doing all of those things. We, we think, oh man, it's, it's not a big deal. I'm just in middle school. And yet you are forming rhythms and patterns that will shape the rest of your life. We just want pleasure, right? Some, some of us are just pursuing pleasure. And yet we see the brokenness sometimes in our own family and, and see it for what it is. We see it for, for being wrong. We see it for the sin that it is, the brokenness that it's caused. So let there be some continuity between what we see that's broken and how we actually live our lives. Let's not settle for cheap pleasure when Jesus offers infinite joy and comfort and grace through a relationship with him. Let's trust him for that and treat one another as brothers and sisters as we should. Amen? Let me pray for us and we'll go to our small groups. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we do not want to settle we don't want to settle for the story that this world promotes. Lord, we know that your ways are better. Some of us just don't have the strength to actually follow them. But you say when we put our faith and trust in you, that you give us your spirit. And by your spirit, you enable us, you give us the strength to live this life out in obedience to you and love to you and love for our neighbor. So Lord, I pray for these students that, Lord, they would wrestle with that. If they haven't put their faith and trust in who you are and what you've done through your son, Jesus, that they would do so. And if they're not ready, that they would wrestle with why that is. Lord, help us to live this out, your story, not our own. We trust you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.